Hello and welcome. In today's video we're going to be looking at this type of dress, we're going to be looking at when it was worn and we're going to be looking at who wore it. Hello, my name is Michelle Barker and I'm the lead researcher for Handbound Costumes and the Georgian Costume Company and basically what it is we do is we study original garments in the museums, we record their sewing methods and then we create replicas to practice those sewing methods and then here at Handbound Costumes we put all of that research into the garments for our clients and we also like to share some of the stuff we've been finding in videos like this. So in today's video we're going to be looking at this gown here and this is what's referred to as a sack back gown here in the UK. In France it's referred to as a robe à la française and we're going to split this video into two parts. The first section we're going to be looking at the history, when it turns up in portraiture, who wore it etc. And in the second section we're going to be looking at a closer detail of how this gown has been made and what techniques have been used. We've studied quite a few sackbacks now in the museums and we've noticed on quite a few of them there's a little trick that the original makers used to help create a really nice silhouette. So stick around to the end and we're going to be sharing that tip. And also any of the images or quotations used in the video will be in the description box below. So the history. The timeline starts with the 18th century and around about in the middle, around the 1750s, a new fashion is birthed. Handily for us, this new fashion appears to be recorded in the art of the time. Towards the end of the 1740s, we mostly see the ladies of the household dressing like this. Now, this kind of painting is what is called a conversation piece and is incredibly useful. Conversation pieces, rather than single grand portraits, feature more relaxed and informal settings, and this is spread down to the costumes. In the 18th century, this informal dress was called undress or half dress and literally means sort of day wear in our modern translation. In this painting by Francis Heyman, the ladies of the family wear plain silk nightgowns or robe à l'anglaise. Then around the early 1750s mark, we get ladies in the conversation pieces suddenly wearing gowns like this. And this is the Clavey family by Devis in 1754. Or like this, and this is Anne Streetfield in 1756, also by Devis. And these are sackback gowns. Now the sackback has been around here in Britain for a while. Being fashionable in France meant they were worn here and Anne Buck states that the sack was replacing mantuas at balls and assemblies during the 1730s. So they've been around in the UK for a while. But the sackbacks prior to this tend to be centre front clothing, they tend to be slightly baggier and in earlier fashions they concentrate much more on the sort of elaborate silks uh, than just the plain silks. So with this new fashion there are three key things. You get the three tiered ruffles at the sleeves, you get trim made from the same silk as the gown, these are called furbelows, and generally the gowns are made from all of the same fabric, a matching stomacher, a matching petticoat and a matching gown. So Lady Jane Coke writes in the June of 1751, You ask me whether sacks are generally worn. I am so partial to them that I have nothing else, a sack and apron with a very small hoop when I am undressed, and the whole ones when I am set out. And remember, these conversation pieces tend to present day wear. This is the informal version of this type of gown. So we know that this kind of heavily trimmed sack back begins to get worn in the early 1750s. And really, this type of trim follows the sack back throughout the rest of its use in the 18th century. So here we have Anne Ford in 1760 by Gainsborough. We have a lady in the newest dress fashion of the 1770s. And Elizabeth Crompton in 1780 by Joseph Wright. So the fur below trim does progress and change as the 18th century moves on. And the difference is in things like the style of arrangement of the trim, fly braid gets added to the edges, and tassels and chenille curls, loops and flowers get added. Lace and muslin can be used in very similar methods to the fur below trim, and gold and silver, lace and braids too get added, and the whole gown gets pushed up into full dress or dress wear, being what we would call evening wear in nowadays sort of language. And the sack back by the 1780s with all of its trim also begins to replace the mantua as court wear too. So who wore it? Well it starts off as a very French fashion and enters the UK wardrobe as a form of undress. Possibly as early as the late 17th century but definitely in the early 18th century. But this style with all the trims likely to have been worn generally by the middling sort and up. I say generally for maids working in wealthy households do appear to have had access to this type of gown. Paul Sambi does a sketch in 1759 of a fishmonger's stall and there with a large white functional looking apron is a lady likely to be a maid wearing a very similar style dress to the one we've made. There are also other images of maids in very similar style gowns. 
But once this style moves up the wardrobe levels to full dress and dress, especially with the more expensive trim like lace and gold braid, then it's likely to just be worn by the middling sort and up, those going to balls and assemblies and fashionable soirees. So, that's the history bit done. Now let's look at the actual dress. So this is the looking at the dress part of the video. And there are three sections to these type of sack back gowns. You have the petticoat, the stomacher and the outer gown. So let's start off with the petticoat. So in this section we're going to look at the different sections of the gown. This here is the petticoat and there's furbelows we were talking about, that's all of this decoration here. The word furbelow actually comes from a deviation of the French term farbola, which means frill or flounce. And there are four different types of furbelows on this petticoat. This one here is sort of the most basic main one, common one that you see on gowns and we just call this the, the plain gathered. You have this one here that's kind of a pinched puffed detail. Uh, you have this section here that's like a little flower, so it's got petals and a stem. And then this one here is what is called the flounce. And you, if you go back to the history section in Streetfield's painting, she's actually got two layers of these, but mostly you see them around the knee level and mostly you see one level, but there's probably different fashions for them. So let's take a look at the stomacher. Okay, so this here is the stomacher, and stomacher basically covers the uh, insert V section at the front of the bodice where the, the robings come. And this one here matches the length of the front point of the stays. Part of the reason why we created this gown was to really test out this lowering of the waistline, this elongation of the body that the silhouette was going for. Um, so yeah, so this is our stomacher, and basically uh, it just has the basic um, gathered trim that you, we saw on the petticoat. This one's also been lined. Not all of them are lined. To be honest, I'd almost say most of them are not lined. Most of them, the, when they come with their original gowns, are just made of pieced pieces of the original fabric, uh, very quickly um, hemmed and, and with the trims sewn down. So they're quite basic pieces of the garment. So let's take a look at the gown. So there's obviously a lot more that we can look at with the gown. And we're going to split it into three sections. We're going to look at the bodice, we're going to look at the sleeves, and then we're going to look at the front skirts. So with the bodice, the front bodice is finished with what is called a robing. This is a really highly fascinating section of the garment. Um, and by this stage, it's developed a lot since the early 18th century. It's become a simple strip of fabric that finishes the front. But it also looks like it has a functional use. Most of the gowns from this period that we've looked at in the museums, these robings have come a little bit loose, i.e. they kind of flap up. You can still see thread, but perhaps the reason why they've become loose is that that's actually a temporary thread that they sew each time they get dressed or use pins. So that you can literally um, use the robing to extend the front bodice or to shrink it if you've put on weight, if you've lost weight, if you're wearing your stays tight or not so tight, or if you've become something like being pregnant. So it's a really interesting idea that though they've developed a lot, they're still being used in a practical way. So the sleeve, this is the sleeve here. You can see the, the cuffs with the ruffles at the three tiers. You've got the, the band that's been gathered in the top. And this is what is called a sleeve knot. And the sleeve gets put in as standard underneath, but over the top gets folded under the robings. So the robings actually hide the top crown and raw edge of the sleeve. So inside the bodice, we wanted to show you this detail here, we'll do a zoom up now, because this is the first sign of that trick we told you about earlier. It's a simple row of stitching, it's just a running stitch, but it actually has a great use. So we'll look at this in more detail when we turn the gown to the back. Okay, so to the front of the skirts, this has just got the basic gathered trim that we've looked at on the petticoats. It is literally the most common one found in, in, in gowns in the museums. And they frame the petticoat, so the petticoat will be full in between them. So that's the front, so let's just turn her over.
and here you can see that the pleats are actually sitting quite flatly that's not we've not done that that's just the fabric weighing itself down when it's on the mannequin you can really see how they pour out at a lot more at an angle but here we have the front bodice going over the back bodice uh, you have the back pleat starting from the back neck going all the way down and it's this detail here that we wanted to show you um, so yeah, we've zoomed in so you get a bit of a better angle. But basically, so this is a row of stitching that holds down the inside back bodice that is under the first pleat. And basically it holds the back bodice down to the lining so that you get a glimpse into the small of the back. It's really simple, but it's really clever. And here you can see the back neck is hidden by a furbelow trim and the way the, the furbelow trim comes right over the shoulder and joins in. So probably the next best thing now is to get her dressed on the mannequin. And you'll begin to see then how the robings work, how it gets all pinned in. So now we're going to begin to get a dress and this is the petticoat going on. Like so. And now we'll pop the stomach on and this is just going to get pinned onto this front section here. So this is the gown and we just put it on like a, almost like a coat. So the first thing is you want to make sure that the robing sit at the bottom of the stomacher. Okay, so we've only pinned one side for now. Um, because we want to show you close up what we've just done. There's this inner ledge here, the way the lining overlaps the, the front bodice, which we really believe is, is kind of like a pinning foundation. It's what they're pinning onto and then they're folding the robings over. Ours is a little confusing because we've extended it um, for the, the weight gain. Um, so our ledge is right back here. Um, but yeah, we're just going to show you that detail as we pin this. Okay, so that's her now pinned in. Let's have a look at some of the details of the dress. So one of the first things is the smoothness over the torso. You can see here how the robings work to really frame that stomacher area and how they sit beautifully flat. Um, if they did hook and eye or you did buttons, you would get bulk from where that all sits. And that doesn't mean they never did, but generally the, the, the overall impression is they used pins or sewing. So now let's just rotate her slightly. So you can see how the robings follow up and that they hide the top of the sleeve. They hide all of that raw edge and that um, the gathering at the top. Let's just rotate her a little bit more. So here I want to show you, we looked at, um, when the gown was on the table, we looked at that sewing stitch that holds the back bodice down to the lining. And you can just see here how that helps create that real in-depth um, of the back torso. So these pleats aren't blocking the back shape of the, the bodice. They are actually accentuating it because they pour out in their fullness but you still see the neatness of the waist which makes these gowns super elegant. Let's rotate her a bit more. Okay so now we have a full view of the back and you can see how the pleats, you have this one, the main bit, this, the, the inner pleat here and then the same repeated pattern and um, you can see how the back neck is hiding the top of the pleats and how this is formed into this outer edge pleat. As we say for the 1750s, 60s, perhaps even early 70s this is pretty standardised. By the time we get into the late 70s and 80s it appears that this width of back begins to shrink where they only want the pleats sitting much more neatly, they're putting a lot more of control in there. Um, and it's become very much sort of tight and neat. Okay, well that's our 1750s to 60s yellow sack back dressed. Um, and if you'd like to know more, please follow us on Facebook or you can check out our website where we've got a page designated to this dress. Um, and also subscribe, it'd be lovely to have you following us. Thank you for watching.